This November, Missourians face a ballot amendment that could eliminate ranked choice voting. I'm Samantha Walker, and I'll have that story coming up. Plus, why emergency managers from seven nations visited Joplin today, and how a nonprofit in Columbus, Kansas is using grant money to provide bedding to children in need. The four states' most watched news starts now. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Dow Quick. A constitutional amendment added to Missouri ballots could change the state's voting laws. This November, Missourians will vote on a bill, a ballot amendment, that if passed would stipulate only U.S. citizens can vote in Missouri elections. While that is already law, another part of the proposed amendment would prohibit ranked choice voting. KOIM Samantha Walker spoke with local election officials to learn what ranked choice voting is and why there's a push to ban it. Ballot Amendment 7 would ban ranked choice voting in Missouri elections if passed. Ranked choice voting is where voters don't just vote for a singular candidate, but can instead rank their choices. Missouri does not currently have ranked choice voting, but the amendment would bar possible future use. We have a concept of one person, one vote in this country. Uh, and on ranked choice voting, you don't have just one vote. You have multiple votes for multiple candidates uh, on multiple issues. Uh, so the, the concept of the one person, one vote uh, is done away with uh, during that process. Campaign Legal Center, a nonpartisan group that advocates for voter participation, says ranked choice voting gives voters more choice at the ballot box by having all candidates available. But Davis says all of those extra choices can make it more difficult for voters, which is why states like Alaska, who implemented ranked choice voting, are trying to repeal it. Because you are choosing for multiple people in multiple ranks, multiple orders on the ballot. And as somebody who runs the elections in Jasper County, and we have people that don't even fill out the current ballot correctly, uh, is very scary to think about uh, how convoluted it's going to be. He says if ranked choice voting was ever implemented in Missouri, it would likely take longer for voters to get official election results. There was a, a number about Minnesota that it took them 13 days to certify an election because they had to count and recount, etc. What most people don't understand is somebody has to get 50%. So if we were to have an election in August and nobody got 50%, then we would have to have an election in September. And if nobody got 50%, we would have to have another election. Uh, so we could have four, five, six elections for the same races prior to the November election. Reporting in Jasper County, Samantha Walker, KOAM News. Five other states have banned ranked choice voting since April of this year. Those states include Oklahoma. On the Missouri ballot, a yes vote would be to prohibit ranked choice voting and multi-winner outcomes in state elections. Pretty nice day out there. Let's check in with Chief Meteorologist Doug Hetty. Yeah, it actually turned out to be a nice Monday for us today after a fantastic weekend. 70s Saturday, lower 80s yesterday. Creeping up a bit, 85 for a high average high is 84, but right where we should be for this time of the year. And if we go outside, very comfortable, low to mid 60s right now. And we're slowly going to drop back as we continue through the evening hours, but our temperatures, they're going to start to warm up a bit as we go through the next few days. So let's go into Tuesday afternoon, temperatures into the upper 80s, so a little bit hotter, and then we should get right around 90 by the time we get into Wednesday, so a little hotter, but at least we're not going to have to deal with much in the way of humidity. Let's drop south. We have what will soon be Hurricane Francine. We may get a little bit of moisture from her. We're going to be talking about that here in just a bit. See you soon. It's been a year since Gary LaTurner was killed in a hit and run crash just outside of Galena, Kansas. A teen, Rococo Joseph, was originally charged in that case and now his father also faces charges. The Cherokee County, Kansas prosecuting attorney filed the new charges Friday against Dr. John Joseph of Joplin. He's charged with leaving the scene of a fatality accident and contributing to a child's misconduct or deprivations. Authorities say Joseph was not driving the vehicle at the time of the crash, but that he instructed his son not to report it. An attorney for Dr. Joseph released a statement today saying the allegations are false and claims that will be shown in court. 
Dr. Joseph is set to appear in court on October 7th. Rococo Joseph faces a felony charge of leaving the scene of a fatality accident. His case has been refiled as an adult. Authorities in Joplin arrest three people connected to what officials say is a large quantity of fentanyl found in an apartment. Officers from the Ozarks Drug Enforcement Task Force and Joplin SWAT searched an apartment at 802 Pennsylvania. That's where they found fentanyl and suspected methamphetamine. Officers arrested two women and one man at the scene. Formal charges are pending. City of Joplin today had some visitors from foreign nations. Emergency managers representing seven countries came to Joplin to learn about the city's recovery following the 2011 tornado. A nonprofit, Global Ties KC, hosted the event where officials could share lessons learned about disaster response. That the people should not be isolated when they're thinking about the world's problems, um, like disaster preparedness. That when, when these visitors from around the world are able to connect with their counterparts and talk about um, best practices, solutions, what they're implementing, that is when the best connections are made. That's when those aha moments happen, and then we're able to take back those best practices to their countries. That event was hosted at Joplin's Mercy Park. A Kansas nonprofit that gives children essentials for a good night's sleep received a grant to help them better serve children in need. KOIM's Melissa Alexis has more. We have sheets, we have blankets, we have comforters. A bed and blankets. It's something people may take for granted, but for some, it's not as easily accessible. A lot of the kids are sleeping on tile, linoleum. Um, very thin carpet, so no support whatsoever. Dream Big Little One is a nonprofit in Columbus that works with mental health services and schools that notice a student is continuously falling asleep in class. Schools can then get in contact with Dream Big Little One to address the need. They're going to school, they're trying to focus, they're trying to function, and they're trying to get their good grades, but it's just really hard. It means a lot to a child because they never forget when someone loves them. And that's what we do. They provide kids in need with beds, blankets, stuffed animals, and more. But they have faced issues with storage, unstable floors, and creating a secure location for families to load their new mattresses. And not have to worry about anybody, you know, tripping or falling. Thanks to the Heartland Grant, they'll finally get the upgrade they've been hoping for. Once we knock this out and get it out of the way, it's going to open up so much space. The kids get very excited. They want to help. They want to unload and load up. So it's always just we really have to keep an eye on the kids up front. So if we can utilize the back alley and load and all of that back there, then the kids are going to be in a lot safer atmosphere. Last month alone, the organization gave out 47 beds to children in need. Reporting in Columbus, Melissa Alexis, KOAM News. The president of Dream Big Little Ones says they're always looking for volunteers and donations to continue helping children in need. Coming up, as more men are diagnosed with late stage prostate cancer, we're going to dispel some myths about screening for the disease. The CDC confirms Missouri's first human case of the bird flu. A patient who tested positive for influenza A and has underlying health issues was hospitalized on August 22nd. They reported having no known exposure to infected animals. Additional testing was involved and the H5 bird flu subtype was detected. About 300,000 U.S. men are expected to be diagnosed with prostate cancer this year. Mandy Gaither has more on the misconceptions when it comes to screening for prostate cancer and when experts recommend men have it done. After decades of decline, late stage prostate cancer cases are on the rise. The American Cancer Society says more than 35,000 men will die from the disease this year despite tools to screen for it. If found early, it is actually very treatable. But the organization says many men are not being screened for prostate cancer. Experts believe it's due to misconceptions about the invasiveness of the screening process. A rectal exam is not actually needed. So I think that's the important thing to know. A simple blood test can and help indicate your risk of prostate cancer. That prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, blood test will result in a risk score, which can help men determine if further testing is needed. 
The American Cancer Society recommends men talk to a doctor about screening as early as age 40 for those who have one or more first degree relatives diagnosed with prostate cancer at an early age. Men 50 and older at average risk should also have the discussion. There's a lot of fear that if one has goes down a certain pathway that before you know it, one's headed to a major operation. But it's really important to know you can start with a simply simple blood test and have a lot of information which can really guide you know further treatment decisions. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Doug is next with a complete look at the forecast. And later, Missouri Southern football hosts their weekly news conference following Saturday's rivalry game against Pitt State. Well, it turned out to be a nice Monday for us today after a fantastic weekend, 70 Saturday, lower 80s yesterday, and then today, most of us made it into the mid 80s, right where we should be for the middle of September. Looks great. Nice shot of our Cornell Arts and Entertainment Complex Tower Cam. We are looking at downtown Joplin. All right, temperatures will start to warm up a bit more as we go through the next few days. Nice crisp morning down into the mid 50s. Once again, we have a light southerly wind, lower 80s by noon. And then once we get into the afternoon, most of us 86, 7, 8 degrees, 85 in Stockton, Pineville 87, Miami up to 86, 86, Vanita 86 in Chanute, Pittsburgh up to about 87 degrees. Then tomorrow night still looks pretty good. We drop back near 60. You can see some mid and upper level clouds kind of streaming in once we get into Wednesday afternoon, but also a little bit hotter. High temps right around 90 or 91 degrees. All right, day planner for you. For your Tuesday, 54 in the morning, 80 by noon. High temp right around 88 degrees during the afternoon. All right, temperatures right now, very nice. You can actually open up the window, 66 in Cassville, 66 in Miami, still 70 in the Odisha, Nevada sitting at 66. Let's go outside here, seventh and range line, 65. Southerly winds are light at about three miles per hour. Through the night, 62 by 11, 54 by seven. I think 54 should be our overnight low and we have clear skies. Nothing is going on here. The entire central plains crystal clear. Let's drop south. Here is what is soon to be Hurricane Francine spinning just south east of Corpus Christi and Brownsville. You can see clocking wind strong tropical storm at 65 miles per hour and Francine will start to turn off toward the north and to the east and then eventually make landfall southern parts of Louisiana. This is going to be midday ish on Tuesday, uh, probably category two clocking winds roughly around 100 miles per hour. As we get into Thursday morning, it tracks up into Arkansas and Mississippi, but the brunt of this is mainly going to stay just east of the region. We're definitely going to get the clouds. We may get a couple showers, but we need the rain. And unfortunately, most of it is going to stay just to our east. Looking at Thursday, look at those mid and upper level clouds streaming in. So here's Thursday evening, that western edge of the rain trying to march a little bit farther toward the west. Most of us, as of right now, look like we're going to stay dry, but hopefully we can get a few showers, but it will definitely cool us down. Look at this, upper 70s to near 80 by the time Friday rolls around. 88 on Tuesday, 91 on Wednesday, 84 on Thursday, maybe a random shower late Thursday into Friday and then clearing out looking pretty good as we go into the weekend. Yeah, let's hope we get a, at least a little bit of rain. It'd we be nice to get a couple showers. Thanks, Doug. Pittsburgh High School is on a mission to get its students to be more health conscious about their meal choices. The idea is so important that they've decided to have a hydroponic container farm on school grounds. The instructor says it's the very first to be set up at a school in the state. KOIM's Lonnie Walton has that story. Um, these students here are working on planting up new seeds that in about four to six weeks will transplant um, inside the container behind me. And this lettuce will, and greens will be grown to provide nutritious food for our students in the cafeteria. 
Science teacher Audrey Rose says this student-driven form container is much needed and hopes students will think about making better choices as well as learning how to direct their own steps in meal planning. We are going to be um, getting students a hands-on experience in growing nutritional food, um, you know, starting hopefully opening up their palate a little bit and also um, introducing them to the future wave of agriculture. Something totally different. I, I've never done any Anything like this before and I think that's what's most appealing about it. The idea started when Rose wanted her class to grow vegetables for a small greenhouse near her classroom for the culinary students. The plan went so well she had to expand to an entire container. Now the whole county will be able to enjoy these farms. They, the, their goal is to have 105 uh, con high school container farms. And if you know Kansas, there are 105 counties. So they're wanting to put one of these in every county in Kansas. Reporting in Pittsburgh, I'm Lonnie Walton, KOAM News. You can help fund the hydroponic farms by visiting the Pittsburgh Farmers Market, where the students work every Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon. And if you can't make it, you can donate directly to the school. Coming up, the next generation of Apple products. Apple bets big on AI to boost its sales. I'm Susan Lee in New York. I'll have all the details coming right up. Financial woes for another big discount retailer, Big Lots, announced it's filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. As part of that filing, private equity firm Nexus Capital Management will take over nearly all of Big Lots stores and business operations the chain is in the process of closing roughly 300 of its 1,400 stores all across the country. So far, neither the Joplin nor the Pittsburgh locations are included, though they say more could be added this week. Apple debuted the latest edition of the iPhone today. Fox Business correspondent Susan Lee has details. Apple's hoping artificial intelligence will boost its iPhone sales. Its iPhone 16 is a tech giant's first mainstream phone to utilize new software capabilities called Apple Intelligence, which is powered by generative AI. Now, to run Apple Intelligence and other capabilities, the iPhone has been built with new A18 chips, which Apple claims makes it up to 30% faster than the iPhone 15. The display also has a 50% stronger ceramic shield for screen scratches and drops. And the new design also brings a devoted camera button on the side to quickly snap shots. The button can also be held down to shoot videos. Now the price tag, the iPhone 16 starts at $799 and that's for a 128 gigabyte model with the 16 plus starting at $899. Now as far as looks go, the iPhone 16 comes in a variety of slightly refreshed colors that are more vivid compared to previous years. The tech giant also introduced upgrades for its AirPods line, and that includes AirPods Pro 2, which contains a built-in hearing aid function. And Apple says its new Series 10 watch has its biggest screen yet, up to 30% larger than previous generations. It's also 10% thinner than the Series 9 watch. These are the most beautiful and capable watches we've ever created. Apple considers the opportunity in AI so important that it dropped a $10 billion project to develop a self-driving car. In New York, Susan Lee, Fox Business. Up next, we're going to see where the Mega Millions jackpot stands after another drawing with no winner. It's one of the biggest, richest jackpots on record. And tomorrow, people will get another shot at trying to capture the Mega Millions prize. The jackpot now stands at $800 million after no one picked the correct drawings during Friday's drawing. The correct number is still out there. This will be the game's seventh largest jackpot. 30 more minutes of news, weather, and sports coming your way. Plans for a wind farm in northern Arkansas pick up steam despite concerns from some residents. Plus, how the presidential candidates are preparing for tomorrow night's debate. You're watching the Four States Most Watched News. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Dow Quick. A controversial planned wind farm appears to be picking up speed in North Arkansas. Chris Bryant has more. Scout Clean Energy is planning to install around 30 wind turbines in rural Carroll County in an area south of Green Forest, Arkansas. 
From hearings and town halls, the wind farm has faced opposition about what it could mean for the county. I share a lot of their same opinions, but that's not what the law says. So that's why we, uh, uh, you have to go by with what the law, people don't want a lawless judge. I will just say that they do not want that. Uh, no matter how much that they would want me to agree with them, I have to go by the law. Judge Ryder says that when it comes to the what is legal, everything has been done according to law. I wish they would realize was that this is not a county thing at all. This is private contracts uh, with private landowners and, and a private company. Uh, the only thing that the county has to do with it is the road, the county road. That's, that's our only interest. According to the Scout website, the 180 megawatt project is expected to cover around 9,000 acres. The wind turbines are coming because we don't have planning and zoning. Uh, then the people do not want planning and zoning. They're ramping up to start building and putting these turbines up. I hope that they're uh, good for the landowners. I hope they make money because if it's good for them, it'll be good for Carroll County. Scout Clean Energy will cover the cost of building and maintaining the roads around the wind farm as part of the road use agreement. When the RUA is ready, I will sign that because, like I say, I think it's a no-brainer for our county. Uh, and after that, that kind of frees them up to ramp up to full speed on, on getting their uh, turbines built. In the end, Judge Ryder hopes that people can go back to being neighbors again. This is, all, this is the greatest place in the world, as far as I'm concerned, to live. And uh, that, that's part of the thing that hurts so much is neighbors against neighbors. People who've known each other for their whole lives they have a difference of opinion. Uh, and that's what I would really stress. That's what I want. That's what I want for us to go back and be a community again. Fire crews in California are battling more than a dozen wildfires across that state, fueled by a dangerous heat wave and high winds. The worst fire is raging in San Bernardino County. The line fire erupted Thursday outside of Los Angeles and has now grown to more than 20,000 acres, prompting the evacuation of more than 11,000 people. The stakes for tomorrow's presidential debate between Vice President Harris and former President Trump couldn't be higher. Fox News correspondent Alexandria Hoff has more from their debate prep in Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia is stepping up security just one day from the first and maybe only presidential debate between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump. I think it'll be like a good square off between the two candidates. I think she's going to burn him up. Burn up Trump? Yeah, as a prosecutor going against a criminal. The pressure on both sides to perform is mounting after a new national poll from the New York Times, Siena College, shows the candidates deadlocked. Trump at 48 percent and Harris at 47 percent among likely voters. Neither one of them can afford a mistake. The tight race making the stakes even higher. Harris has been preparing over the weekend in Pittsburgh, practicing crisp two-minute answers, according to her team, and having a Democratic consultant play Trump, while Trump's camp has projected confidence and at times dismissing the need for in-depth prep. She's been preparing for this, these very types of scenarios where Trump is going to go off the rails, where he's going to lie, he's going to, you know, not, not, not tell the truth. She can run, but she cannot hide from her tenure during the Biden administration. So when you look at what this debate's going to be, it's going to be the opportunity for Americans to see two candidates who have a fundamentally different view of what this country should look like. As of Monday, there are no other debates confirmed between the two presidential candidates, although a rematch date in October has been pitched to both sides. In Philadelphia, Alexandria Hoff, Fox News. A bit later, we're going to check out the latest innovations in creating hurricane-resistant homes. Well, it turned out to be a nice one for us today. Temperatures mid 80s during the afternoon, right where we should be for this time of the year. It looks great outside. Uh, nice shot of our Cornell Arts and Entertainment Complex. Tower cam, we are looking downtown Joplin. Clear skies is what we're going to see through the night. Kind of crisp. We drop back mid 50s once again. We actually got into the 40s. 
yesterday morning, which was kind of crazy. And then as we go through the day, we should go into the lower 80s by noon. Most of us four highs, 87, 88, 89 degrees. So a little bit hotter than what we did see today, but still the humidity is going to be low. All right, let's go into Tuesday evening, Tuesday night. We slide back into the upper 50s once again. Also notice some mid and upper level clouds starting to develop, and this is going to be ahead of um, really the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico with our tropical system by Wednesday afternoon, some mid and upper level clouds, high temps right around 91 degrees, but overall our temperature is pretty good as we go through the next couple days. All right, day planner for you tomorrow, 54 in the morning, 80 by noon, 87 by four sunshine all day long, high temp of 88 degrees. If we look outside right now, feels pretty good. 65 in Cassville, 61 in Grove, 70 in Chanute. Nevada is sitting at 67 degrees. Heading outside, 7th and range line, 65. Southerly winds are light, and they're going to stay light as we go through the overnight hours. 62 by 11 down to 54, rebounding to 73 by 10 a.m. Nothing going on. We need the rain. We just don't have much in the forecast. In fact, the entire Central Plains Nothing is going on. Let's drop south. Here's tropical storm Francine clocking winds at 65 miles per hour, moving north northwest at five. She's going to take a turn to the northeast and then start to head toward southern parts of Louisiana. So by midday Wednesday should be making landfall strong category one or a low category two hurricane. Then the remnants will start to turn north and west. So you can see the center of circulation kind of goes right up the Mississippi River and eventually tries to pass into southeastern parts of Missouri. Here's the problem. We get the clouds, but you can see the cutoff of rain doesn't get that far back toward the west. So yeah, we're going to have mostly cloudy skies on Thursday, keeping our temps down just a bit. But this rain just doesn't want to advance very far toward the west, and we need the showers across the region. It's been very dry, dry. We're in a moderate drought for a good chunk of the four state area. So again, most of this week we stay mainly dry. Maybe that tropical moisture will shove back toward the west just a hair. We'll keep our eyes on it. 88 on Tuesday, 91 on Wednesday, 84 on Thursday. A little bit cooler as we head into Friday uh, with the clouds and a few showers and then clearing out just in time for the weekend. Great. Yeah, it does. Thanks, Doug. Coming up in sports, Neosho squares off with Seneca on the softball diamond. We're going to have highlights from that game. Plus, Pitt State football climbs the rankings in the latest coaches poll. Brock Baldridge has that story and more. High school softball enters its third week of the regular season. Last year's defending COC champion, the Osho Wildcats, play host to neighborly Seneca this afternoon. Home game for Neosho as the Wildcats host the Seneca Indians on a rare 1 p.m. start time. In the circle for Neosho is Carly Kennard, and she was impressive once again. She pitches for five innings, strikes out six batters, and no earned runs on the afternoon for the future UCO Bronco. Bottom of the first, Becklin Garrett at the plate goes the opposite way, and that ball lands for a base hit. Two runs coming to score. Wildcats get on the board. Neosho leads Seneca 2 to nothing. A few batters later, how about the freshman Sadie Leach? She drives one deep into the corner. That scores Garrett from third. Leach hustles around the bases and is in there for the RBI triple. Neosho leads 3 to nothing. Later in the game, Neosho trying to add on to their lead, but Callie Fields is there to run this one down with a nice sliding catch. Seneca looking to rally back in this one. We head to the final inning of the ball game. Kaiden Smith fielded this one cleanly, throws out the runner at first. Neosho takes care of business. Wildcats shut out Seneca six to nothing. Over to Webb City, the Lady Cardinal softball team is back home looking for their seventh straight win, taking on the McDonald County Mustangs. Top of the third, Mustangs at bat. Dakota O'Brien smacks one off the left field wall. Kirsten Hopkins comes in to score. McDonald County strikes first, leading one to nothing. Mustangs aren't done yet. Freshman Cheyenne Starr keeps this ball fair down the right field line. Another run scores, and McDonald County leads by two. But the Cardinals unfazed, Olivia Nieberg. Pops one up into left field. It falls between the defenders. Carson Cahoon 
runs it in, and we're tied up two to two. We skip ahead to the bottom of the fourth. Lily Hall hits this one sharply off the defender's foot, and Hall earns herself a two-run double, and well, bring out the dance party in the dugout in this one. Mustangs unable to stay in it. Addie Burns wraps it up with a strikeout, and the Cardinals take care of this one, eight to three, and improve to seven and one on the season. Well, the Missouri Southern football team hasn't started a season at 0-2 since 2021. Missouri Southern football looks to regroup after a tough outing, losing the home opener last Saturday. A tough loss to a number three, Pitt State. Uh, I was proud of the way our guys started out and we competed. Um, I thought we went toe-to-toe -to -toe for three out of the four quarters. That second quarter was really the difference in the ball game. I I'm excited that um, this will be the first time that we have the same starters going into the next week. You know, we added Deontay back, we added Akeem back. So we'll, we'll have some continu continuity going from game one or game two to game three in terms of our two deep. Um, well, we've shown that we can compete with anybody in this conference. Like I said, it's just coming down to the small details. Once we eliminate them, it's, I mean, it's free game. Sticking with college football, the American Football Coaches Association releases its latest coaches poll. Pitt State football jumps up two spots and is now ranked as the number four team in the country. This comes after Pitt State beat number three Ferris State and Missouri Southern to start the season. So here's a look at the top 10 in the AFCA coaches poll. The defending national champion Harding Bisons take the top spot. MIAA opponent Central Missouri is at number two and of course, we have Pitt State at number four. We have another MIAA team in the rankings, and that is Emporia State, who cracked the top 25, comes in at number 21 after the Hornets start the season 2-0. Number four, Pitt State is scheduled to host number 21 Emporia State this weekend in Pittsburgh. And tonight is the first Monday night football game of the year in the NFL. It's also the first time that we hope to see Joplin native Isaiah Davis suit up to play his first regular season game for the New York Jets. At last check in this one, it's the San Francisco 49ers who lead 29 to 13 over the Jets. So I'm not sure we'll see uh, Joplin Day or Isaiah Davis tonight because the Jets, you know, they're going to have to come back in that game, throw the ball a little bit, but we'll be keeping our eye on it for the yeah, rest of the that, season. Yeah, he's just starting out and we'll see. Maybe yeah. he'll get some playing time. We'll be right back. As the peak of hurricane season quickly approaches, cities all across Florida are coming up with unique ways to help protect homeowners from suffering serious damage during tropical storms. A new hurricane-resistant home has hit the marketplace. And Fox Business correspondent Ashley Webster shows us what it's made of. We are in the middle of the hurricane season, so far so good, but certainly here in South Florida, we know what damage a strong hurricane can do. And that's why this home that's just come to the market is getting a lot of attention. It kind of resembles a bit of a bunker, but the difference is in the construction. Instead of pouring concrete, they use what is called ICF, insulated concrete form. It's kind of like Lego bricks that are built on top of each other, and the end result is a very strong home. Take a listen to what the developer says. But instead of you know, pouring the concrete every four feet, um, it's actually poured all the way throughout the home. Um, and there's vertical rebar and horizontal rebar that's put in place every 12 inches. Um, so essentially, you're building a bunker. So we have a sturdy home, but also we have things like impact windows, which can handle flying debris up to 200 miles per hour. You can see how much these windows provide not only protection, but also insulation. And it also helps with insurance costs. Insurance and getting home insurance in Florida has been an issue, but a home like this, and you'll be able to get insured. They're looking at the cost of completion and the cost to repair. Um, so this type of quality is sure to have a impact on the cost of insurance um, versus something that wasn't built to the same standards or a home that isn't as new. But storm protection doesn't always come cheap. This home is listed for $6.85 million. Five bedrooms, seven and a half baths, nearly 7,000 square feet. But it certainly could provide a blueprint for the future when it comes to hurricanes and surviving the storm. In Boca Raton, I'm Ashley Webster for Fox Business. Back to you. Coming up, we're gonna check out the newest entertainment options for you to enjoy at home. 
An animated sequel, a western epic, and a country music superstar are among the new digital DVD and music releases available to add to your home library. Fox's Ashley Dvorkin runs down the list of what's new in home entertainment. Make some noise! The box office hit Inside Out 2 tops this week's list of what's new in home entertainment. The animated sequel follows Riley as a teen experiencing new emotions, including anxiety and envy. Kevin Costner co-wrote, directed, and stars in Horizon and American Saga Chapter 1. The Western epic is set around the years of the Civil War, chronicling the expansion and settlement of the American West. The old gang back together again! Bette Midler, Susan Sarandon, Megan Mullally, and Cheryl Lee Ralph star in the comedy The Fabulous Four. They play longtime friends who reunite on a life-changing trip to their college friend's wedding. Hello. Hi. Andrew Scott plays a gay man grieving the loss of his parents who develops a romance with his mysterious neighbor in the romantic fantasy All of Us Strangers. I did not commit this crime. Available only on digital, Chiwetel Ejiofor wrote, directed, and co-stars in the drama Rob Peace. The film follows the true story of the late Robert Deshaun Peace, an intellectually gifted young man who risked everything he worked for to free his imprisoned father. I am an echidna warrior. Small screen favorites to own. The six-part Paramount Plus series Knuckles features Idris Elba as the voice of the echidna warrior. And Peacock's Ted Season 1 is the prequel series to the films and follows the foul-mouthed teddy bear helping his friend navigate his teenage years. For music fans, jazz soul singer Lady Blackbird releases her new album, Slang Spirituals. And country star Miranda Lambert pays tribute to her home state with her new album, Postcards from Texas. In Hollywood, Ashley Devorkin, Fox News. And that's our time for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We're going to leave you with a video of an aardvark enjoying some birthday treats at the Point Defiant Zoo in Washington. Let's make it a great tomorrow.